My name is Derek Leggott. I was born in uh, Old Trafford, more towards, I suppose, more towards Wally Range in Old Trafford, actually, uh, on the 4th of May 1937, just in time for the uh, Manchester Blitz in 1940. Although I don't remember a great deal about it, I was only, as you can imagine, young mm. at the time. Uh, I was just um, three and a half when the Blitz came on. I do remember being in the air raid shelter, but not a great deal about it. Even with my grandparents, mm. or some of my grandparents. But Dad was away. Dad was away with the army, and my mum, well, she was there with us. Had two uh, kids to look after. I left school at the age of 15. And I started work in Trafford Park with um, a, a woodwork, John Reeves wood, wood firm making veneers for furniture and things like that. And I left there and I became apprentice coppersmith, in which I worked in terrible conditions on the <laughs> on the on the banks of the um, the, the um, Bridgewater Canal in Stretford. I say as an apprentice coppersmith, and I'd grown up. All my life I'd known nothing but people being in the army. National service was on. All my friends had been called up for national service and so it was looming for me. But they had an offer on at the time which offered me an extra pound a week if I did an extra year's service and didn't wait for the national service. I was just 17, just turned 17 when I, when I, when I signed on. And this is one of the reasons why I had to do an extra some extra time because they don't calculate your service for your pension until you reach the age of 18. So I gave my nearly a year's service without being properly mentioned. However, I did enjoy I did just did the three years initially and I came out and then I re-enlisted in March of 1958. I joined the army in um, 54, December 54. I enlisted into the Royal Signals in December 54. I was called, called forward in January uh, 55. And after basic training and trade training, which was up in Catrick in North Yorkshire, very cold part of the world at that time, I'll tell you. Uh, we initially were at the top of Richmond Hill, which is a song about the sweet lass of Richmond Hill, but we didn't see any. We were confined to camp all the time then, yeah. Anyway, I uh, did uh, six weeks, six or eight weeks basic training, which is the usual square bashing and all that kind of stuff on weapons and stuff. Then a further six months trade training down in Catrick itself. Uh, after all the training was finished, then we were posted off to, I got posted out to the Middle East, initially to Egypt. And why I went to Egypt in the first place, I don't know, because... We were, the British Army was just pulling out the Middle East, out of Egypt then. I was there for just three weeks and they moved me over to Cyprus. What year was that you went that to That was Egypt? in 1955 and at that time there was a nasty little uh, terrorist campaign going on in Cyprus uh, by a, a, a group called EOKA. I think it stands for Ethniki... Afghanistan, Kiprion, Afghanistan or something. But anyway, it was George Grievous was invited. The General Grievous was invited over by Archbishop Macarius to get. Initially, they wanted Enosis union with Greece, which we said no because nearly a third of the island were Turkish, and um, which is why the war. Little war went on for about four to five years. A lot of I I wasn't particularly involved in that because the regiment I was with in Famagusta, we were involved in um, more or less intelligence gatherings throughout the Middle East. Can't tell you exactly what it involved because I'm still bound by the Official Secrets Act under that one. But it was a, a very very top secret work we were doing in Famagusta in Cyprus, and that's about all I can tell you about it. We were only involved with the terrorism in, in as much as when, whenever we went out, we did armed escorts for, would you believe the school children, British school children out there, had to go under escort to school because the terrorists had posed a threat uh, to them and to other British civilians 
who were living in the camp who had to go to various places to work and we did armed escorts for them and uh, apart from that it's a beautiful place Cyprus to be and Famagusta one of the nicest to be however it was a time of great unrest and the following year in 1956 you probably heard about the Suez crisis the so-called Suez fiasco militarily it wasn't it was a complete success so I went back to Egypt uh, on the invasion of Suez and I didn't drop with the Paris we sailed over from Limassol on the MV Parkston which is an old Second World War German trooper which we'd captured and uh, we sailed from Limassol on an overnight trip and landed, landed in Portside on the 5th of November. Right. Um, how long were you in Cyprus before you went to Egypt? I was in Cyprus before I went to Egypt just over the year just over the year then I went to Egypt we were in Egypt for about a month. We went in November, came back in December, about the 18th of December, when the United Nations troops took over. The, the shooting in, in Egypt, in Portside, only lasted for a day. And then we were stopped by, initially, the United States, who were paying our way at the time, and then by the United Nations, who sent a team of peacekeepers in to take our place. And then after Egypt, I came went back to Cyprus. But of course, what the, the, the fallout from the, the Suez was that General Nasser, or Colonel Nasser as he was at the time, that he was broadcasting to all the other Arab nations of the Middle East, saying that the Egyptians had risen up and kicked out the French and the British, and indeed the Israelis, out of Port Said and out of Egypt and the other countries could do the same. And bearing in mind that in 1955-56 Britain and France just about owned the whole of the Middle East, or we occupied it, we didn't own it but we occupied it. So one of my jobs then from Cyprus I flew down with a detachment about 20 strong, we flew down to Aden which is right at the very southern tip of South Arabia we flew down to Aden and our job as radio operators and special operators and all that was to listen in to the pirate broadcasts and try to pin them down and then get the infantry to come and lift them if we could. Uh, but that was one of the well, fallouts from the Suez thing and it's the, the, the end, it's still happening today with the Arab nations, they're still resentful of it and it was, it was Gamal Abdel Nasser who initially stirred them all up after Suez. Then I went back to Cyprus and then a few months later I was what they called demobbed in the, in December 1957. Um, because I had not waited for national service but had volunteered I couldn't get my apprenticeship back. So I went to work as a labourer in Metro's Iron Foundry just down in Trafford Park. And I didn't like it. And so after about three months, I re-enlisted in the army. And was shipped straight back out to Cyprus. Uh -huh. um, going back to the first period of your service, yes. um, did you think that what you did there was worth it? Yes, at the time we did. Indeed, we, we thought we were fighting for the right cause i.e. we didn't, I mean it, Cyprus in its history has never ever belonged to Greece it's just the majority of the population were Greek speaking through emigration and what have you and we thought that it would mean unfair to the Turkish Cypriots if, to, to have let them have Enosis or union with Greece so we thought we did a good job yeah. even though people did get killed on both sides I think in the four years of the troubles there, the British forces lost about something up to about 200 men, and and women of course, because one or two of the wives had been, were, were killed while over there as well. They, they, everybody was a target mm. for the terrorists. So yeah, we thought we did a pretty good job. And um, day to day, what was life like out there? Day to day, well, we were, we were largely uh, confined to barracks. 
except when we went out on, on either patrol or on official business, as I said, armed escorts for the um, for the families and, and civilians. So we couldn't get much of a, we didn't have much of a life outside the barracks. We were confined to barracks, but we made our own fun. And, uh, you know, it revolved around the old Maffi canteen and playing, playing table tennis and cards and things like this, you know. Uh, so yeah, it was a bit dull at times, but the work was interesting. But mm. I say I can't talk any more no. about that. Do you look back with fondness at that time? Yes, indeed, I do. Mm. Yes, I do. And um, things like food and all that sort the of thing. The food was pretty basic in those days, pretty basic. But we, we, there was enough of it. I mean, when we went out on operations or on exercise, which we didn't do many exercises in Cyprus, it was all operations and certainly at Suez. We lived on what was called composite rations, compo rations, which were infinitely better than the rations we were getting served up in a cookhouse back in camp. Mm -hmm. Because um, there was plenty of it and it, it was pretty good stuff. Mm -hmm. And of course we got extra money as well, we got a local overseas allowance. And we got cheap cigarettes and cheap booze and things like that. So they more or less encouraged us to smoke and drink and, uh, and all this, you know. But yeah. uh, Were you ever involved directly in any skirmishes or battles? Not in Cyprus, only in the Suez invasion, 1956, where the only battle we, we, I took part in was the actual landings when our own forces were shelling the, um, the beaches and the houses in Port Said and then the Egyptians were actually firing at us as we landed. But that's about, it, it only lasted for about an hour after we landed and then it had all finished. So in that respect, I didn't get involved in any actual skirmishes there, no. Did you have any low points when you were abroad at this, this period? In the initial period, uh, no, not, not that I can think of. It was, we were kept pretty busy. And so you had high points? Uh, the high points, I suppose, were when we, we had, there was plenty of swimming. We, we, we could get down the beaches, but as long as it was on the guarded beach, but we could get down the beaches and go swimming, which was probably one of the best parts of the whole Mediterranean to go swimming in those days. You know, uh, not many tourists going around because of the terrorism that was that was on. Mm. So the high points, is, yeah, we did did. did uh, <laughs> <laughs> improved my swimming greatly and uh, of course even down in Aden but in Aden of course there were so many sharks around mainly hammerheads and things that we had to swim in the, they had fenced off beaches which were fenced off because of the sharks mm. so we felt pretty safe mm. we felt pretty safe there, yeah. I only stayed down in Aden for about seven months six or seven months then came back to Cyprus in order to get demobbed. Do you think you were affected mentally by that period of service? That mentally, no, I don't think so. We, we were... We'd grown up with the war, all through the war, uh, through the bombing and all the other parts. Of it. So, a little bit of shooting going on here and there. We were shot at once or twice uh, in Cyprus, but uh, nothing, nothing particularly big. Um, but we, as, we, as I say, all of us had grown up during the war <coughs> and the bombing and the shooting and all that was nothing new to us really at all. I mean, even in where we were in Wales we were occasionally bombed, but not, not a lot. Nothing like in Manchester, because even towards the end of the war in Manchester um, we were still getting the one or two of the V-bombs, the V-1s, V-2s. Not as much as London, of course, that was the main target, but we did get the odd one or two. Uh, but there we are, no, it, I, we didn't get any, any, any trauma out of it. Did you receive any medals or awards for that? Only the general, general service medals. This, they gave us, that's all they ever gave us in those days, for every campaign we served. And I got the general service medal for Cyprus under class. Would you believe it says all the headquarters Middle East were in Cyprus. <laughs> Egypt, which was nearly 100 miles further over, was classed as the Near East. 
and the, the, the medal, the general service medal for the Suez operation was we got the clasp Near East and then the one for, for Aden, it came out later that they gave us another clasp for our general service medal with a clasp with a t the title Arabian Peninsula because there was a lot of problems going on down there at the time in Aden as well not only with these pirate radio broadcasts but with the, the country just a little bit up north which was called Yemen nowadays all of it is called the Yemen but then in those days Aden Protectorate was the headquarters of British forces Arabian Peninsula it was quite a big operation so we got a, a, a clasp for our medal general service medal for that how did your family feel about you being away in the forces? I had no, well, I only I didn't have any family as such. My mother and father was at home. Again, it was natural to them. If I hadn't joined the army, I would have been called up national service anyhow. So they expected it to happen, and, and it was just a part of part of life. No one, uh, we didn't. Nobody, you know, gave us any kind of welcome when we came back home again. It was just thought natural that we would, we would go out to these trouble spots and do what we had to do. So after you were demobbed, yes. you decided to re-enlist? I, 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 only, I was only out for three months. I came out, well, in December 1957 um, and I re-enlisted in March 1958. Was that? And then I stayed in for the rest of my service for the next 20 odd years. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I say, once I'd re-enlisted, I went straight back out to Cyprus again because the trouble was still bursting over there. And uh, we were, th then I went up to Nicosia initially, and we were very much involved in the troubles, although um, we weren't acting as such in an infantry role, which when all said and done, the infantry are the guys on the ground who did the bulk of the work when it comes to close them with them and capture them and all that. We were in direct support of them. I was doing rear link, that's a rear link communications from an infantry uh, headquarters back to do, back to a brigade headquarters. So we were with the infantry, right up, you know, uh, every time they went out on operations. I was actually with the Oxford and Buckinghamshire Light Infantry for a while during the rear link. Uh, we were stationed mainly back up in Nicosia. But the low point of my career then was in 1958. I was a bad boy and I got court-martialed. <laughs> I was court-martialed in uh, 1958. I was a corporal at the time. Quite a lot of reasons for it. I don't need to go into the detail, but I was what they call busted, demoted to the ranks. And uh, then I got posted down, as I said, down to Limassol with the Oxen Bucks. Didn't take me long to get promoted again because I got fed up of being on what, what was called, it was called CB in those days and it was a natural thing for you to get confined to barracks. But it involved a lot of punishments and I didn't like it so I thought, well this is a joke, I'm, I'm being silly here, you know. Everybody else getting charged and getting another five or six days CB. <laughs> Which, which was a bit hard. They don't do it nowadays, they stop it now, they call it restrictions of privileges or something like that. And then I finished, I did another three years in Cyprus, I went from Limassol back to Nicosia, and from Nicosia down when the trouble finished and uh, that particular regiment disbanded and I went down to Decalia where we were just doing straightforward static communications Where's Decalia? Decalia is in the south of the island in, in, in Cyprus. Did you see more skirmishes or battles? No, this time? We did, no, no, it was all finished. By the time I went down to Decalia, it was all finished. Yeah. The only skirmishes we saw was when the, um, sorry, with, the, with the infantry doing rear link, and they went up into the hills and were flush, flushing the terrorists out. But by that time, it was just about all over anyway. The terrorists were just about ready to pack it in, which they did. It was a successful operation we took part in because the terrorists didn't get their didn't get their um, aim of union with Greece. 
But you know what followed on from there. I wasn't there at the time, but then some years later the Greeks tried it on again and the Turks were all said, no, they're only 40 miles over the water. The Turks said, no, you don't, and they invaded and they're there to this day. But I wasn't there then, I was in uh, Northern Ireland by then.